Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Koi Bo. I'm the Vice President for Industry Relations uh, at SCAT, and I'm very happy to introduce our guest today, uh, Axel Le Bouffevant and uh, Andrew Cudless, to our uh, on commission discussion today. Uh, Axel is the uh, creative director for Perrier Jouet, a champagne uh, producer uh, based in Champagne, France. Uh, before leading this creative team uh, there, she was a freelance creative director for several interior and tableware companies, including uh, Philippe uh, Deschuliers and Arc International. Uh, then she moved into cosmetics, uh, working with uh, Shu Owemura, uh, Kills, Jean-Paul Gaultier, and Narciso uh, Rodriguez. Uh, ultimately, her career path led her here, uh, working directly with one of the most well-known luxury brands uh, in the world. As many of you know, uh, Perrier Jouet is the official champagne, a sponsor for Design Miami, and every year they collaborate with Establish or emerging designers to create unique and dynamic installations at the fair. Uh, Excel has been integral in the creation and the founding of this uh, tradition and co of collaboration and partnership. So, welcome, Excel. Thank you, um, Koi. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce our second guest, Andrew. Andrew is an award winning designer whose uh, recognition includes uh, the 2019 AIA National Honor Award. Uh, in 2004, he founded um, Maxis, uh, a design studio uh, exploring emergent relationships between architecture, uh, engineering, biology, and computation. His work has been exhibited internationally and is in the permanent collection at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and the Frac Centre in Orleans, Orléans, uh, France. Uh, in 2019, he became the first American to contribute to uh, Louis Vuitton's Object Nomad's collection and is well known for his breathtaking uh, sculpture, Strand Garden, uh, a piece that was commissioned by Perrier Jouet for the Design Miami in 2016. I'm very much uh, looking forward to our discussion today about your collaborative process and, and uh, what inspires you both. Uh, but before we do that, I, we're going to show you a quick uh, video of, of the project Strand Garden. My visit to Epernay and the tour of the cellars and the tasting and the trip to the vineyard really inspired me to focus on some of the materiality that's involved in champagne making. For the ice bucket, for example, I was interested in how we could take the, the skin and the seeds and do something new with that. Powdered form of the skin, use a process to uh, 3D print the, that powder into the ice bucket itself. So in the end, you have the beautiful glass bottle uh, that contains the liquid champagne, but then the ice bucket itself is made out of the solid um, Chardonnay grape skins. That's such a great video. I love the work that yeah, you both have done with uh, this project. Uh, Excel, maybe we can start with you. Uh, I'd like to ask you the question. So um, Perrier Jouet has had a long history with uh, Design Miami and for the 2016 partnership. Uh, can you lead us through uh, how you selected Andrew as a collaborating artist to express the cultural heritage of, of the house? Um, I think it's, it's a story by itself. Um, it starts with uh, the, the house, you know, Ben Jouet has a 200 year uh, legacy of um, um, art. The bottle was designed by Emile Gallet in 1902. And um, we were uh, looking, we, we started that collaboration with Design Miami uh, in 2012. And at some point we wanted to pay tribute to our wonderful uh, American partner, and we're looking for a, an American designer. Believe it or not, <laughs> I discovered Andrew's work in France, not in the US to start with. Uh, one of his pieces, part of a permanent collection uh, at the Frac Orléans, the center of France, 
and that piece really is tried to me. Uh, if uh, you want to move to the next slide, um, I the, it, it's it starts. The reason why Andrews weren't really um, caught my attention is that basically all we do uh, we do um, as um, um, it's a way to propel our heritage into the 21st century. And I think Andrew's work being really anchored into um, um, a certain vision of art and nature, um, you know, it's, it's um, architecture, engineering, it's highly crafted, it's computational. There's lots of different um, sides to Andrew's work. And I think he was very inspired by the house itself. So this is the house in Epernay. Uh, we uh, there have the biggest French Art Nouveau collection in, in private hands. And the way we select the designers is really through that vision of uh, what are the four pillars of Art Nouveau. The first one being um, adding beauty to everyday life. And I think what Andrew does on an everyday basis is really about adding beauty to everyday life. Um, the second pillar is about... Um, uh, uh, and a thing that is um, crafted, handmade. So maybe you get to the next slide. Um, and um, it's about a total um, vision of the arts, a global vision of the arts. Andrew is not only an architect, a designer, he's a maker. We were really impressed by his way of working. I mean, there's, there's things, there are things that are highly technological into it and at the same time uh, there are things that are totally um, crafted and handmade. I mean it's, it's fascinating to see Andrew in his studio and you you saw a little part of it in the video. I mean uh, really the 3D printing and then suddenly uh, he gets um, a brush and starts brushing it. You know it's, it's a lot between uh, the, the technology that is fascinating, so studio work, and then to finish with, it's the, the fourth pillar as the inspiration by nature. And um, if you can get to the next slide, um, the, um, the process is uh, always the same. We bring the designers to the house. So Andrew met with our uh, artist, our cellar master, who crafts the wines, and inspired by both station with uh, our cellar master, with um, the, uh, the collection at the house, and the, uh, the ethos of the brand, you know, um, nature and its processes, Andrew made his proposal. Fred Design Miami, uh, where we exhibited uh, Stranded Garden. So this is, I mean, if, if we go through all these next slides, I think what is interesting is it shows um, Perrier-Jouet's commitment to bringing uh, young designers to a global scene because Design Miami is definitely for us the biggest um, uh, design platform, collective platform in the world. And um, I think Andrew, I'm not going to talk about it. I think it's more for you to explain this, but I think it's a pretty interesting platform to get a global visibility. And I think it led for you to other projects, which we're super happy about. Um, so in 2012, we started that uh, partnership with Design Miami and uh, we started with Glycerol. Then next slide, we moved on to um, several other projects, one with uh, the Mesher Traxler, and once again, that one was really paying tribute to nature. We're very committed to re-enchanting the world with beauty. Then the following one, uh, then after mm -hmm. Ephemera, we, uh, they, we, we took the Mesher Traxler uh, to uh, the London Design Festival, the beauty of Design Miami platform is that not only it gives a platform to the designers, but it grew Perlijouet visibility and the creative world. And then other platforms asked us to partnership with them. So uh, we went to London uh, during the London Design Festival uh, with the Mesher Traxler. And after that, we even extended it to uh, 
uh, other dimensions. And we did this with Andrew too. I mean, Andrew created a full experience for Design Miami. And at the same time, he created a, a nice bucket, which is part of a smaller and more intimate experience. So with the Mr. Traxler, we did a limited edition. And here you are, uh, Andrew uh, and Miami uh, with their wet in 2016. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I love this idea of the four pillars that you use as kind of a, a filter for how you, you select your collaborations. And, and just going off of the those that you collaborated before and, and with Andrew, including Andrew, it just seems like you've done a great job picking, uh, and it's really reflective of the house, of this kind of idea of very diverse uh, uh, artists and designers and, and very dynamic. I mean, I was looking through this and there's such a kind of an experiential, you know, everything is, is very experiential. It's very, you know, uh, site specific. And, and it's also very much about, um, about the brand. Andrew, if we can um, get you into this conversation, can you um, uh, tell us kind of how you approached this project? What was kind of your uh, recon mission when you went uh, to the headquarters and, and the house and, and what were your impressions? Sure. Um, if we go to slide 25. Um, so when I visited, I was, um, there are basically two inspirations. One was, of course, the, the work of the house, the Art Nouveau uh, work. And um, one of the things that kept kind of coming back to me was the, the geometry as someone who's you know, very invested in, in the relationship between kind of form and performance and aesthetics. Um, I was just, um, you know, the, the, the motif of the strand of, you know, sometimes it was a, um, a line in the stained glass or um, uh, painted onto the wall or the um, gold on the bottle um, or like a, a strand of hair and a, and a painting uh, from Art Nouveau that there's this kind of linearity that's, um, that every line, there's a thinness and a, a flowingness to a lot of the work of Art Nouveau. Um, and and I, I really appreciated how that kind of geometry pulls very different things um, from kind of atmospheres to, to vines, a woman's hair, um, kind of together in, in one motif. And the other part that I was inspired by was just the materiality of, of the, the process of making. I really appreciated kind of like geeking out a little bit with the, the seller master, just going through every step of the process from the, you know, the picking of the grapes and the tending of the plant to um, the presses, the, even the robots, you know, that, that are <laughs> working in, in parts of the, the process, um, that I see it as all like one really phenomenal um, technique that so much time and effort and skill is put into uh, producing uh, the champagne. So I, I chose four uh, materials, um, the oak from the presses, as well as the oak from the um, riddling racks uh, in the cellars, uh, the chalk uh, of the caves, which was just phenomenal, you know, that these caves were kind of hand carved uh, out of the natural uh, chalk. Um, the kind of woven baskets that were traditionally used uh, in collecting the grapes. And then finally, the, the grapes themselves. You know, if you think of the, like I said in the video, the, the um, champagne being like the liquid essence of the grapes, I wanted to somehow work with the, the solids of the grapes, which we often kind of, you know, forget about, you know, um, but it's, it's, they're part of the process. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I basically used each of those materials to produce um, each of the four kind of main design objects within the, the, within the installation. The largest of them was the oak screens. And um, for those of you who've been to Design Miami, um, it's kind of an exhilarating and chaotic experience in, in the best sense of the word. You know, as a designer, an artist, you go there and you're like, you're just surrounded by the most amazing design. And it's, it's kind of overwhelming in a creative sense. You know, like you're, you just want to look at everything and you want to meet everyone. And, and there are, you know, chairs that you've seen in, in history books that you, and um, 
it's just, it's it's incredible, but at the same time, it is a bit overwhelming. And ironically, there's there's not like a moment of calm within the space. And that was the first thing that like came to me is that I want to kind of create a a, a clearing in the forest um, where you could kind of get away from the kind of um, hubbub, of the, the noise, the movement, the visual kind of stimulus of of everything around you and, and feel kind of more centered and, and calm. So the oak screens basically set up this, this um, kind of small barrier maybe, or a, a screen from that, that, that an other environment. And we purposely chose to paint the, the booth black compared to many of the booths that are white, you know, putting the, the design objects on display. I wanted to kind of remove the room in a way and just kind of feel like you're, you're sinking into the space and, and, um, discovering this this other world. Um, so then once you're into the space, I, I wanted to create a place to sit, you know, like, a, like I said, it's ironic that you know, you're surrounded by thousands of chairs <laughs> and you can't sit on any of them. And um, so uh, that's where the, the oak benches came in, um, where I worked with Concrete Works in, in Oakland to develop a specific mix of concrete that would kind of replicate the chalk uh, color and texture and kind of variability um, and that you could then move the benches around and the, the to or they're actually more like stools that when you move them they can form you know different benches um, and then the third object was the the table in the min middle that kind of referenced the the woven baskets and they kind of glowing from within uh, and then finally the ice bucket at the very center I'm happy to go through more detail any of those in, in following slides um, or could <laughs> yeah move on. I, I, can yeah. I just build on two little details that are really interesting Please, I yeah. think um, you inspired by what you had seen and and Ebernay, you created an experience in Miami that was um, I think in terms of emotions pretty close to what you can feel when you go down to the cellars and our cell is at 200 years old and you created an experience that it was emotionally pretty close with a very 21st century approach, which was uh, for us um, really interesting. And you said, and that's, that's just, you know, an insider story, but I think it's interesting to tell. You said that um, you, you created that world uh, inside the fair so that we could escape the, the overwhelming activity of the fair and you know, all your peers around. Um, what Andrew created that it was so attractive that um, I remember that um, uh, conversation, Jean Nouvel, you know, walking into uh, the booth and having a conversation with you, like peer to peer, about how you were making things and, and could this be built at, um, uh, a larger scale and you know it was really interesting and this is the beauty of design Miami I mean you create something and then it creates a conversation yeah I, I, I that's amazing uh Jean Nouvel was there I'm uh, starstruck um and Andrew I, I love the, the the procession of the experience I think you talked at, at first about the screen being a barrier but at the same time there's kind of this per, you know permeable or you know uh little openings when I think you mentioned seeing people's feet and it's kind of, you know, brings you into the, into the space and then all those other sequences. Can you two talk about um, how you collaborated on this project? Andrew, was it about um, uh, bringing a, an idea to Excel and Excel, did you respond to it? How did that work? Yeah, I mean, I, it was a very, it was a long process. Um, I think maybe 18 months altogether, which yes. for a very yes. small installation, it, it was like a more typical architectural project. It had a long timeline, a lot of discussions, a lot of time to reflect as well. Like I actually, a lot of the inspiration came from um, Excel inviting me to design Miami the previous year, the year before in 2015. And just kind of wandering around the space, you know, by myself and, and just kind of experiencing that, that overwhelming kind of sense of inspiration on one hand, but also just, it was almost too much too. <laughs> it was just, so 
Um, from there, I, I made a, a proposal that, that really focused on the, um, well, they weren't screens yet. It was more of like a forest. And I think after I visited Design Miami, I realized that the, the kind of forest was maybe, it was close to what I wanted, but it needed space. It needed more space for people to come in, but more kind of emotional and, and um, more yeah, psychological space, let's say. It had to have a, a clearing. Um, and then we went, um, I don't know, Excel, if you remember, but quite a few months and then maybe, I don't know, eight months before or something like that, uh, the suggestion of, of having benches and a table and the ice bucket and it got later. Yeah. Yeah. It was later, but it was like, oh, that's exactly what the clearing needs. You know, it needs more pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, 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 that what is interesting is that it's really a process, you know, the idea that um, we, we need time on both sides to, first of all, get to know each other. <laughs> That's one thing, you know, it's when you know that you're going to spend a year into 18 months collaborating, you, you, you have to create that relationship. And I think it's key. Um, and, uh, and we loved one. Andrew and we would love to do you know more um and and it's it's about yes it's about building a relationship and it's about making sure we understand the other uh, the other ones the other parts world so um yes um I can say this endless conversations lots of sharing you know even though Andrew was based at the time in in Auckland and and we're based in Paris you know, trying to meet halfway in Miami, uh, trying to get Andrew to come to, to Paris, which was not that easy because as a teacher, Andrew cannot, you know, um, uh, find time all the time. And then, you know, as I would like to take a week off from around. teaching. <laughs> as yes. much as I'd like to take a week <laughs> off from teaching you, go to Paris, it's not always easy. <laughs> That's a good problem to have, Andrew. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it's, so, so it, it, yeah. it's really the conversation you it's really about building a, a, a clear understanding of what uh, what are um, what is the 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 artist vision and and where he wants to take his creative gesture and making sure we give him the means so uh, that was super important and that we add layers to it because it's, yes, it's about producing a beautiful piece, but it's about communicating around it. And it's, it's important how we build the communication and the content. And it's not just the piece, it's really a collaboration. It's, it, it goes way beyond producing. And it's important that, I mean, there's a big team um, at Bear News where supporting and, and making sure things are uh, visible and, and easy going for the artists and at the same time it's about building the vision together. What was surprising for me about that process was you know, this was the first kind of um, collaboration with a, a brand for me and you know when, when XL first emailed me I was like what in the world would a champagne house <laughs> want to do with me? You know? <laughs> and you know, because it just seems so far outside of what I had had done previously. But then as I, I worked with Excel and her team, I began to realize how much I had, my experience had kind of prepared me for that. You know, as an architect, you know, you're, you're trained to, to, I hadn't thought about it this way at the time, but you're in some ways trained to try to um, understand what the brand of the client is. And even it might be just a couple building a house or a, a store or an office building, whatever it might be, um, that a lot of it is really about understanding who they are uh, as a company or as an individual or as a family and, and building something for them that, that speaks to them and about who, who they want to be and who, how they want to communicate themselves to the world. Um, so it, it actually worked really well, I think, to, to work with a, a, a company in this way like Perrier Jouet. That's great. And, and, and from what you both are saying, there's also this kind of, I mean, successful collaboration about trust. And there seems to be this trust uh, between Excel to what your skills, what your talents are, and your trust with her of kind of, you know, keeping you 
uh, within the, the, the kind of the track of what the language to be to represent the house, which I think is, is amazing. Um, Andrew, here at SCAD, you know, our mission is to uh, prepare our talented students for creative profession through um, engaged teaching and learning. And through, through our uh, curriculum, we, we always try to uh, emphasize that it's not just about, you know, a strong concept, but it's about developing that concept and bringing it to life. Um, so, you know, and, and, and through kind of the constraints and challenges of that process, can you talk about possibly any uh, challenges? I know uh, Excel was talking about kind of the challenge of being a, a world apart and collaborating. What other things did you find difficult that you had to overcome to make this successful? If you could uh, go to slide 33, I think that um, would be a good one to focus on. Uh, basically the, the design of the ice bucket um, was a, a big challenge um, because it was so experimental um, where um, I, I, like I said previously, I, I really wanted the ice bucket uh, to be the most kind of intimately related to the, the process of making grapes. And I was really kind of just searching for many months, like a way to, to do that conceptually. And I, I had this idea of like, well, you know, if this, like I said before, if the, the champagne is the liquid essence, like what is, what, where does the solid part of the grape go? And I had, you know, we, I, I, I had no idea actually at the time, you know, and, it, and I began doing more research and um, found that, you know, the, the, obviously in the process, the grapes and the seeds, the skins, they all have to be, you know, taken out of the press and the, the liquid goes on to make the champagne. Um, but often the, the other material of this, the, the you see in the person's hand there um, often gets just composted and turned into new soil for the grapes. Um, and I began to wonder if that, that material could be used. And I went and um, started doing more research and discovered that it can be uh, dried and ground into a powder and used as a uh, gluten-free flour for baking. Um, and at the time you could actually go to like Whole Foods and buy it in the Bay Area. And um, so I, I discovered a source for that material, that flour, and then approached uh, my friends at Emerging Objects, a uh, 3D printing company in the Bay Area who have experimented with many different types of printing, uh, with different types of materials with printing, but they had never used grape skins before. Um, so we did some tests, which you can see in the lower left there, very just simple vessels and, um, you know, how to big challenge, you know, just does it print at all? And then once we determined that it printed, like, how do we get around the issue of the printer being much smaller than the ice bucket? You know, so you had to somehow make an ice bucket out of many parts that didn't leak and, <laughs> um, kind of hold together, um, and, you know, just, I, I think I, I packed this little um, vessel uh, up in my suitcase and brought it to uh, a lunch uh, with uh, Axel and the cellar master and kind of just talking about that, you know, this, you know, to be able to take that material, you know, that he was so familiar with and see, like, see it transformed into a small, very simple cup, I think was a big kind of moment for me. Um, and it gave me confidence that this is like something that could be done and, we could scale up with it. Go to the next slide. You can see the, the final uh, image of the ice bucket. Um, so once we had that, the, that we knew on a technical level it could work, the next challenge was kind of aesthetically of like, how do you um, make something of, that's made of parts, but still kind of holds together um, and uh, aesthetically. And I had the idea of just, you know, that the, the grapes are dried out, that they're squeezed of all of the, the juice um, and that the, the ice bucket should have this kind of dried up, almost like raisin-like appearance uh, to, to kind of evoke the sense that, the, that they've, the moisture has been removed and has been like brought into the bottle and, and turned into uh, the wonderful champagne. That's great. Um, I, I love that story because, uh, you know, I think it speaks about kind of this idea of circularity as well. And it seems like, you know, the, that, that object is the, the one piece where people can actually come up and, and kind of interact with it with their hands, which really 
kind of once again kind of uh, references you know the the first part of the process, which is the hands picking the grapes, and now it's the hands you know holding this vessel, which is which is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. That piece, yeah. I'm sorry, Cord. That, Go that ahead, piece please. was uh, was um, you know collaborating with artists for us is key because they opening new doors. They are opening our minds. They are making. Um, they're bringing impossible ideas and making them possible. They're opening the future. And when you have 200 years of history, it's important to keep, you know, building the path to the future and not just be nostalgic of the past. So what, what that piece made for us was really key because I think it opened um, a totally new vision for the brand. Uh, we, we were really focusing on re-enchanting the world. And then that piece uh, brought us to um, structure our thinking on re-enchant, reuse, and repurpose. And suddenly, you know, it's in 2016, I mean, it's, they seem to be things like pretty normal to any kind of corporate company today. But when you go back four years, you know, talking about repurpose and reuse was not that usual. And I think it was really Andrew bringing that idea through that specific piece. It's, it's just to illustrate how important the, uh, the collaborations are to us in terms of vision that the artist can bring to the brand. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I was reminded, please, uh, audience, feel free to please um, uh, send us some, some questions. We'd love to, to, to use those at the end for, during the Q&A session. So please uh, do so. Excel, you, you say uh, that point, I wanted to kind of go off of that quite a bit because it's the idea of your role as the creative director. So you have this house that has this 200 year uh, heritage and then you, you, know, you have to celebrate that history, that heritage, and then you have to bring it forward to the future and what, what that means. And, and this was a perfect kind of example. Can you talk a little more about you know, how you go about being the creative director and how to, how to celebrate uh, um, this brand in that way? Well, I think it's it's just a matter of balance, you know. We um, when when you have such an amazing heritage, it is key. Uh, and maybe we can go to um, slide uh, nineteen. It's key to um, not um, just be nostalgic of the past and and to never consider touching anything. You know, we did celebrate uh, in two thousand eleven our two hundred year anniversary with an amazing artist when Daniel Arsham created that transmission piece. It was, yes, it was 200 years of heritage, but at the same time, it was about propelling into that, that vision into the future. What I hope is my thinking, whatever I do, and my hope is that it, it goes that direction, whatever I do, is, it has to last at least 200 years. So Andrew, we won't be there anymore, but I really hope, you know, in 200 years time from now, um, you were inspired by Emil Gatti and the collection. I hope that the future generations will be inspired by your vision, you know, uh, your, your understanding of the world, creation is, of how we have to be respectful to our environment, how we have to reuse, repurpose, re-enchant. I think it's it's really important to me that whatever we do, it's going to be long lasting and it's going to open um, a path to for the future generations. If you see on the following slide, I guess we have um, the uh, very first uh, limited edition we did uh, on our um, uh, Belly Bug bottle. So if you can go to the following slide, um, it's um, we do pay respect to our um, uh, to our heritage, and um, Josh, can you can you put the the following slide up so that I uh, it, it illustrates what I'm saying? Um, the the Emil Gali bottle was designed in 1902, and uh, between 1902 and 2000. 12, it was untouched. You know, that kind of icon nobody wanted to touch. 
Mm-hmm. And then in 2012, we did that limited edition with Makoto Izuma. And maybe it's just on my screen, but it's not showing. So um, it's um, showing on, it's on my screen. Makoto is, it's not showing on your screen? No, no it is. It is, yeah. It is, okay. So uh, the, Makoto Azuma is a, a, is a um, Japanese floral designer doing amazing pieces. He sends flowers and, and, uh, and the atmosphere. He, I mean, he is amazing. And he designed that bottle. Um, and it was a kind of dialogue between Emil Gelli 1902 and Makoto Azuma in 2012. Mm-hmm. I think was, you know, suddenly we, we, we can play with our uh, heritage. We mustn't be afraid of it. And we must give space to contemporary artists to keep building the heritage. And I think this is, I mean, this is at the core of my job. And you said a very important word, Koi, you said trust. I mean, yes, as long as you build trust with the artists you work with, the vision is gonna be amazing. And I'm, I'm very comfortable that we will be building um, a long lasting legacy too. Um, I think I trust myself in choosing the right design. <laughs> you have so far, I mean, they've been such great collaborations. Um, I wanna ask you each this question. Um, obviously context is so important given um, what's going on currently. Uh, with the with the pandemic and luxury brands and houses having to change within this world that we live in right now, uh, Excel, what are the specific ways that uh, Harry Azouette is is moving its creative direction to accommodate such changes? Or if if you are uh, in things like the manufacturing and partnerships, or you know streamlining the process, are are there things that have been affected by by the uh, current situation for you? Um. I think we we have adapted and adjusted. You know, uh, we have shown a lot of agility, and and um, all the people we collaborate with have shown that same amazing ability. I think we, I mean, it's it's the the how can I put this? The positive side of what's happening right now is that lucky us, we have amazing technology. I mean, I would have loved to make it physically to have those conversations with you, but at the same time, we can have that conversation today, thanks to technology. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, based on, on this, we were able to keep building uh, the future. Yes, things have been affected. I mean, most of the art fairs have been canceled for now over six months. And it's, um, it is a pity. I mean, we, we had to cancel, um, I mean, Art Basel Hong Kong was canceled. Um, Design Art Tokyo was canceled. Um, uh, Masterpiece in London was canceled. I mean, a lot of those platforms, which uh, we give uh, an opportunity to, um, through which we give an opportunity to our designers to really show uh, their creativity. But we we found other ways, um, thanks to you know technology and and we we keep building, um, we're happy. We, Design Miami is putting together a smaller exhibition. I mean, not the usual big fair, but they're still doing something for the local community in Miami um, in December. And we're super happy to be part of this. Uh, we wanna show our support to uh, the platforms that have been supporting us and collaborating with us. Yes, it, it, I think it transformed um, everyday life for all of us, but as a, um, um, a, a house, which goal is to re-enchant and add beauty to everyday life, we really wanna to stick to that idea that we still can celebrate. There are still beautiful things out there to celebrate and we wanna be part of this and we wanna help building that uh, positive vision of um, life. Yeah, I think, and, yeah, yeah, just real quick, I think um, for me um, and, and also my students and my teaching, it's affected that we're all spending so much more time at home. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, there's there's a good and bad parts of that. Like, I think we, so much effort had been put in the design world of a kind of the outside of the home in a way, especially within architecture, um, like 
over in my own education and, and most of my teaching, we almost never assigned um, a home as the design project. It was always art museums and skyscrapers and you know big public libraries and things like that. Not that those aren't important, but we had almost like forgotten the home, you know, the domestic space and how critical that is to us. And over the last few months, we've spent so much time at home. And I think it's been, um, it, it's changed the way I, I think about the design of space and the design of objects. It's a much more intimate experience. And um, it's been really exciting to kind of re-engage uh, domestic space as a, a really important um, area of research. That's great. Thank you both. That's, I yeah. think for us, it, it, you know, it probably accelerated some of the projects, as you said, Andrew, it's, uh, it created a different conscious. Uh, and um, some of the projects we had about, uh, you know, um, creating fully recyclable uh, boxes or um, making sure all we're doing is um, responsible in terms of the environment, things like this. It has tremendously accelerated all those projects and thinking for the brands. Uh, I think, it, yeah, it, 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 for all of us, developed a different conscious of our environments. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Um, Andrew, I wanted to, obviously, we, we want to give you both, Axel and, and Andrew, some time to talk about um, the collaboration, Axel, that you've been doing uh, with uh, uh, other designers and Andrew about your design process, the project you're working on. And, and uh, so if, if you can, why don't we start with Andrew about, you know, the, the other work that you're taking on, you know, and, and uh, we're getting questions, a lot of cool questions uh, using the words, you know, geeking out, um, because I think everyone wants to understand uh, or at least get a glimpse of, of the technical process you go through. Uh, so if you can share some of your work and, and touch on uh, project, my favorite project is, is P-Wall. It's, it's a uh, it's a really interesting uh, process that you go through and, and I'd love for you to share more about that as well. Sure, if you could go to slide 36, please. Um, it, it's also one of my favorite projects, um, partly because um, yeah. the way I kind of discovered it in a way that um, it was, it kind of changed my process where I was really, this is maybe 2004, four or five, uh, I was heavily invested in learning a lot of digital tools. And um, I had designed something in the computer and I really wanted to make it in reality. And every time I tried to make it, um, it was basically this kind of smooth funnel shape. And every time I tried making it out of plaster with fabric, it, the fabric kept on expanding and wrinkling and blemishes and uh, love handles and all these things that kind of started coming out of it. And I was kind of so angry that, that I was just like and frustrated that it was my first term being a professor and I kept on making what I thought at the time was so ugly. And um, I kept on seeing them as mistakes because it wasn't like, it didn't, wasn't a per perfect replica of what was in the computer. And after about three months, I realized that that whole thinking was wrong, that I had to kind of accept the, the world as it is in a way, and that the process was telling me something that, um, that, that maybe the, the imperfections and, and the, these, the things that I couldn't control should be more um, valued in the process, and that the computer doesn't have to simulate everything. It can help be as a tool to help guide part of the process, mm -hmm. Uh, or inform the process, but that the materials that I was using, the, the, the um, elastic fabric and, and the plaster in the early versions um, was producing forms that were beyond my ability to model them in the computer. And they were producing things that I just, I couldn't imagine in the computer. And that was exciting for me that it was, it was um, so I just said, well, what if, I just do more of this, you know, instead of it just being one of these that I do hundreds or, you know, and I start thinking really carefully about how I place the constraints on the fabric so that um, I have, you know, some control about where these kind of bulges appear, but exactly how two or three bulges interact is, is kind of beyond my control. If I would pour the plaster, if I set up the constraints exactly in three different molds and I, just pouring where I start to pour the plaster in would completely change the form. Um, so, and then when it was 
uh, you know, when the exhibition opened and you can kind of, this is much later, like six or seven years later at the, the FRAC in Orléans, the, what was most valuable to me was the, the interactions that people have, you know, that it's in this version, it's solid, it's concrete, you know, it's cold, hard, you know, concrete, but when you're there, it almost feels like velvet, you know, it looks soft. You want to crawl onto it and hug it. <laughs> um, and it was just that there was this resonance that I began to realize that, um, that the, the process that I was using um, it resonated with our own bodies because, I mean, not to be too disgusting, but like we are kind of a liquid interior with an elastic skin. And the, it, I wasn't intentionally designing something that looked like a body, but because the underlying physics and materiality of it was similar to the body, it, it resonated with us, I think. That's great. And, and um, for clarification, my actually my favorite project of yours is Strand Garden. Uh, 2016. With, uh, <laughs> this so is we, we, I, I absolutely love that one too, Koi, because this is the one piece thanks to which I discovered Andrew's work. There were two pieces at the FRAC that year, that one, which is a permanent one, and the one piece from the, um, from the um, uh, Centre Pompidou, and this is how I got to discover Andrew's work and, and started digging into it, found out that he was based in Auckland and then had a little conversation with Alexander Cunningham, who was at the time um, uh, the, the, the creative director at Design Miami. And she didn't know him. It was like, what? And we decided that we should go together. And on, unfortunately, Alexander couldn't make it, but I... I flew to Auckland to meet Webb Andrew. And the, I mean, it literally started because of that piece. So I love that piece too, love it. <laughs> and so, you know, the, you seem to be spot on when you pick these collaborations. Can you share, if you, are you able to share what, what's on the, on the books, what, what's in the you know, near horizon as far as collaboration with the house and other designers or artists? Um, what uh, thing is because of the situation and so many um, art fairs being cancelled, we now working on December 2021. So that seems to be really far, but for us, it's just the right timing. And unfortunately, I am not able to say why and who. And I, you know, um, what direction we're taking, but. Um, I think it's going to be a big year because we're going to celebrate our 10th year, uh, our 10th anniversary with Design Miami, and uh, I think it shows how um, that collaboration goes beyond a collaboration. I think that Design Miami and Values were a family to each other, and we built that relationship, and we really would hope it's going to keep lasting, but stay tuned because I think 2021 for us is going to be a really Great. beautiful can't wait, year. Can't wait to see what, what you come up with or your collaborations come up with. Uh, Andrew, uh, you mentioned that, uh, I think you, you had said that this was your first collaboration with, uh, with such a big brand, a uh, luxury brand. Um, and then you moved on. One of your other projects is with a collaboration with Louis Vuitton. Uh, you're you're like hitting these things out of the ballpark, man, with with your partnerships. Can you talk Popular about in France? <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that project as well? Sure. Um, if you go to slide forty, please. Um, so, I mean, I think this this project, and I, I don't know the the origin story perfectly, but. I first became like really more aware of the um, Louis Vuitton object nomad collection at Design Miami because I was there for two weeks, you know, setting up and you know talking with people, deinstalling, and I was maybe 50 feet from the Louis Vuitton um, booth, and I would walk over there and I was just admiring the work so much. And I think Excel actually introduced me to. Uh, one of their creative directors and, um, you know, whatever it was, three years went by, I think, mm -hmm. and out of the blue received an email from them uh, asking me to 
uh, develop something for their collection. And it was actually, it was almost as, as open as Excel's invitation in that it was, they just said, look at the collection. If you see something that is missing, then design it. You know, it, they didn't say make a shelf. They didn't say make a chair. They said, we have a lot of chairs, but if you see a chair that, that needs to be part of the collection, um, then, then make that. And um, it was really interesting because it was, I was, it was kind of, you know, starstruck on one hand, kind of overwhelmed with the opportunity. And so I, I think I proposed, I don't know, I proposed three initial designs, um, none of them shelves. <laughs> and um, they liked one of them. And then a week later they said, oh, no, 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 we've chosen someone else to do something, you know, in the same area. So come up with something else. And I was like, okay. So then I proposed, I think, outside furniture. And it, that went through th a few rounds and finally got to shelves. I proposed three different shelves. Uh, they accepted one of those, um, which is the version you see here. And then a month later they said, okay, we need a standing version of this. And in my mind, I was like, but it's all hanging. How, how does it stand? And they're like, exactly. You need to make a standing <laughs> version. So um, I very naively was like, okay, well, we'll take the hanging version and, and hang it from like almost like a, how a swing is hung from a swing set at a children's playground. And I presented that and they're like, no, 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 you need to make like exactly what we see here, but just standing. It doesn't, we don't want it to look like it's hanging. And it, that, that was the hardest part. I don't have an image here of that, but like of taking something that, that looks like it's hung, but actually is, is very stable and is, is, you know, working in compression rather than in tension. Um, but it involved a lot of work going back and forth with the craftsmen and um, the, the leather workers, the carpenters in Italy and in, and in France um, to develop, um, you know, using, 3D printing, five axis CNC milling, like there, it was just a ton of work happening in a very, very short amount of time. I think it was, you know, a third of the time that we had for the Design Miami piece uh, with, with Perrier Jouet. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with the result in the end that the, the idea was to produce a, a shelf that felt like it was being kind of being pulled in two different directions. Uh, and it was related to my ideas of travel. You know, that was one of the, the inspirations for the brand of, um, it just wanted, how do I feel about travel? It was very simple. And, you know, I think a lot of the other designers had a, a very positive sense of, of travel. But for me, it's, it's always difficult because you're, you travel and so exciting new people that you're meeting new sites new foods and so forth but you're also a little homesick and you're tired and you know um and that but when you're home you just want to go travel again and you, you kind of feel like you're being pulled in two different directions um so i wanted the piece to kind of have that that literal tension in it where the wood felt like it was bending um under the force of of gravity right and I mean, the, the piece came out beautiful. Uh, I think it's such a, an amazing piece. Andrew, I, I, you know, I just wanted to close up and uh, with uh, thanking both of you. Um, I think, especially when you mentioned, Andrew, the, the way that you were going through the process and you were getting frustrated and, and you let the process kind of show you the way, and even the way you shared the story about the, the swell wave shell here, where you were putting out proposal after proposal and it was no, no, and then it hit, you know, yes. and this is such an important point in the things that we try to teach our students. It's about iteration, right? It's Definitely. about mm -hmm. constantly chipping away at it and, and, and listening to that process. And so uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And Excel, thank you so much for your vision and, and uh, you know, your you. support. I think it's brands like Perrier Jouet that, I mean, make these things happen and, and bring beauty to the world. And, uh, and, and, and as you mentioned, starts conversations. And so thank you so much for both of you for joining us today. And uh, we look forward, hopefully, to seeing you in Savannah or we will come visit you, Excel, in, in France. We'd love that. Thank you very okay. much. Great. Thank, thank you. you very much. It's great talking with you all. Bye. Okay. Wonderful. Bye.